Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. We have four or five special weeks throughout the uh, academic year, which we focus on uh, Bible exposition, uh, missions and evangelism, uh, a scholarly lectureship, uh, different emphases, whether Christian education or church planting at different times in special chapels. But this week, uh, every semester, we give over to uh, an emphasis, an intentional emphasis on uh, living the spiritual life. Our founding president, Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, wrote a book that was uh, fairly well known and used it quite extensively called He That Is Spiritual. In uh, walking by the Spirit, uh, being led by the Spirit, being filled by the Spirit, not grieving the Spirit, uh, not lying to the Holy Spirit, not quenching the Spirit, but walking by the Spirit. And so uh, that emphasis continues and we want to spend uh, this week in that kind of a concentration. It's a privilege for me to introduce our speaker for the week, John Townsend. He is co-founder of uh, Cloud Townsend Resources. He's a psychologist, a relational expert, a business consultant, and a leadership coach. He earned his uh, Master's of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, his PhD in Clinical Psychology from Biola University. He's a visiting professor for us here at DTS, and he's clinical director of the American Association of Christian Counselors. Additionally, he has written or co-written more than 20 books selling over five million copies, including the two million uh, selling bestseller, Boundaries. His latest book is entitled Leadership Beyond Reason. For more than 20 years, Dr. Townsend has engaged audiences, organizations, and leaders around the world, providing practical solutions to life's problems. He's the co-host of a nationally syndicated talk show, A New Life Live, which is aired in 180 markets He's been interviewed on Fox News, television, published in magazines such as Personal Excellence and Focus on the Family. He and his wife, uh, Barbie, have two sons and they reside in Southern California. Uh, what I like about John and love about John in getting to know him is uh, he is saturated with the scriptures and it comes through his counseling, it comes through his teaching. And we are delighted to have him back on campus today. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. John Townsend. Good morning. It's really great to be here. Um, I just love coming back to the seminary and seeing uh, the faces of the people and having the memories of all the great relationships and tools and training. And I, I just have been very grateful for uh, the years of the Dallas experience. Uh, <clears throat> I always enjoyed my coursework. Um, I loved the, the theology and the Bible and the homiletics, and I enjoyed the Greek, and then there was Hebrew. <laughs> and Hebrew sort of had me around the throat. But I remember uh, one of my Hebrew professors, Don Glenn, who's no longer here, uh, used to encourage me. And he used to say, look, I know this is hard, but right now as we speak, there are thousands of little kids in Israel speaking this. <laughs> and that would encourage me. <laughs> so then I got married and had kids, and when my kids had to take French and Spanish, I would say, look. <laughs> but it didn't help them very much. <clears throat> um, we have a week that we'll be talking and spending time with about leadership and about you because um, you're called. God's called you to lead and to serve. And in many different vari various ways, because the seminary has so many departments now and, and specialties, you're called to go out there and make a difference. And so what I'm going to be doing is talking about certain particular aspects of leadership that hopefully will be a help to you and what you want to do and maybe challenge you in your thinking. I think the best way to do this is to start off with my own testimony of when I was here at the seminary and an event that changed my entire viewpoint on leadership. Um, anybody remember Steak and Ale restaurants? Uh, Steak and Ale restaurants got me through seminary. I was a waiter the whole time I was here. I was at the Lemon Avenue one and the uh, Spring Valley one and uh, the Richards one, one and 
probably worked three or four nights a week to get through school, and I loved the experience. And I always enjoyed it because you get out there with the people, and after you've been studying all day and kind of, I don't know, it was kind of a different experience. And I remember walking in one night, and I went up to the hostess. And if you ever have done restaurant work, the hostess is the person that says to the waiters, okay, your station's over here in that corner, that corner. And I'll call her Cindy, but Cindy was my hostess. And I didn't know Cindy very much at all. I, I didn't know what her spiritual condition was. I just knew she was a nice person. She was a warm person, and we always really got along. I liked her. So I walked up to, my, uh, to the hostess desk and said, hi, Cindy, how's it going? She said, fine. I said, where's my station? And she said, well, before I tell you, aren't you one of those God people? <laughs> and I thought, well, I suppose so. Nobody's ever said that. Yes, I'm a God person, I suppose. And she said, well, I've got a God question for you. Now, all of a sudden, the heavens opened because I'd been studying Hebrew and Greek and all the theologies, and I had a head full of stuff. And, but nobody was asking me what was in my head. <laughs> I had all the answers looking for a person with a question. And I thought, this is great. She's going to ask me about the Levitical table. <laughs> because how many centimeters is that seraphim from the cherubim? She's staying up at night. <laughs> and I knew the answer, so. And I thought, no, she's going to ask me about the hypostatic union. Is it 100 100, 70 30? Is it a split decision? But what happened in her real question changed the entire course of my life and ministry and career in one 30 second conversation. She said, My question for you this guy that I live with, he does a lot of cocaine, and when he does, he hurts me. He hurts me. I didn't know what to say. I just stood there, and I felt so bad for Cindy and, and knew that she was living a nightmare that people shouldn't live. And I remember thinking, okay, God's the big chess master, and he puts God people, us, up against God searchers, them, to have something transformational happen, and it didn't happen. And I couldn't think of one thing to tell her, and I went through all the verses I knew, and I couldn't think of one thing to tell her. And finally, I said something like, Romans 8, 28 says that God, you know, is for those who love Him. And I saw the light sort of come out of her eyes, and she was trying to be polite, like, well, thanks very much, thanks very much. And she was sort of taking care of me, really. And she went on to her work, and I went on to my work, but I couldn't think. I, I don't know what I did that, and I don't have a memory of it. I just remember getting in my car, driving back to my apartment up in North Dallas, and I was praying, and I said, something went wrong. Something went very wrong here, because I know you, God, and I know you well enough to know that you're a good God, and you have answers for the Cindy's of the world, and something didn't happen. And that whole experience made me so grateful for what I got here at Dallas Theological Seminary because I was being trained to be an independent student of the Word, an independent student of the Word of God. And I went on a five-year Bible study. And I said, let me take the lenses off. Let me take all the hermeneutic stuff off. What does it really say that I can help ascending? And I discovered something. What I discovered was that I had been concentrating on all the right things, Theology proper, bibliology, Christology, all the right things except I'd missed one. The thing that I had missed was anthropology, how we are made, what we are like inside, what the Bible teaches about the way we're wired, and what I would say the missing piece was our character, the interior life, the part of us that is hidden. I didn't know much about that, and I could use the tools to study that. And I began to study the character and in interior life that Cindy had, and the part that I had, and the part that you have, and it all fell into place for me. And the passage that really jumped out for me 
was in Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. And in this passage, Paul lays out a concept that it really has helped the last 20 years of my thinking and speaking and writing. And this is the passage on suffering he talks about when he talks about the value of suffering. And in verse 3, Paul says, Not only so, we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He's given us. And that word for character in other translations and in the Greek, one of the definitions is the word experience. Experience. That you're the sum and substance of the experiences you have with God and with people and with the trials of life and the victories of life, that experience is what creates character. And what I found that was experience was what I was missing about real life and that we have a real God with real people and what is real life about in the Bible. And so I came up with a definition of character, myself and my writing partner, Henry Cloud. And that definition is what began to form a, a way of thinking about people to help them lead, to help them grow, to help them change. And here's the definition I want to give you, and then we'll walk away from that into sort of what that means for us. Character is that set of capacities required to meet the demands of life. That set of capacities or abilities that you and I are required to have to meet the demands of life and reality. Because life has demands. You and I have demands on life, and they're not bad. They're just the burdens of life that we all have got to bear. Life has certain requirements. We have a demand to have a spiritual life and a walk with God. That's a demand. We have a demand, if you're married, to take care of your marriage. If you've got kids, to take care of your kids. The demand to learn your academics and learn your training. The demand to learn your ministry. The demand to stay in shape. The demand to work out your finances. And we need these capacities, these internal abilities to pull all that off. Character is what you've got in your quiver that helps you to live life successfully. It's a practical reality. Well, what's this got to do with leadership? It's got everything to do with leadership. My model of leadership has five pieces to it, and character is one of those pieces. The first piece is your mission. We all need to know our mission, right? Why are you here on the planet? What's God got you here for? What's the BHAG, as Prof. Hendricks used to say? What's your mission? The second one is your, your core competencies. Some of you are called to teach, some to preach, some of you are in media and arts, some of you are in counseling, some of you are called to academics, some of you are called to mission. But what's your core competencies, the things you're better at than most people? The third aspect is your leadership competencies. Those, those are different than core competencies. They have to do with how you relate to people in a leadership way. Some of you relate to people in a relational way, and you connect with them at very deep levels. Some of you inspire people. You know, you're supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. Some of you are good at that. Some of you are better at the vision aspects, but you've got to understand your leadership competencies as well as your core competencies. The fourth aspect is your connections. How do you relate to a board of directors? How do you relate to people working for you? You're going to have to figure that out because you're going to be in a structure in the church that has all sorts of different kinds of relationships to it. But the, the issue that we're going to be dealing with all week is our character. Because I've worked with Christian leaders for many years now, and I have found out that if you've got all the other four, your mission, your core competencies, your leadership competencies, and your connections, your character... The capacity that you have to meet the demands of reality, your character is either going to accelerate your vision or it's going to sabotage it. So when in doubt, look at your character. And I'm going to unpack that. But that's how important it is. Of all the five, I'd probably start there. I'll give you an example. A good friend of mine is a pastor, and I coach him through his career. We work together. And he has people that report to him. He has four people in a large church that report to him. He has the youth guy and the marriage and family guy 
and the men's ministry guy, and he's got the singles. Actually, the singles uh, leader is a gal. Four people re- report to him. So he directs them and trains them and keeps them going and resources them. And they have what they call 360s. And 360 is when somebody working for you evaluates you and somebody you work for evaluates you. It's a very good tool because you get assessed and evaluated by people that know you very well. And my friend was a very good, affirming, positive, encouraging guy, spent the time with his direct reports. But when he got the 360, it was negative. And he came to me and he was devastated. He said, I put my time into these people. I'm not the absent leader. I really want to be with them, and I'm spending time. What's going wrong? I said, well, you got to go talk to them. Let's find out. And he went to me. He said, why did you guys, like, mark me down so far? This is devastating. You know what they said? They said, we don't trust you. You don't trust me? I have lunch with you, I ask about your families, I go to your home, I pray with you, I encourage you, I affirm you. They said, right. He said, what am I doing wrong? He said, when we go off base, you don't tell us the truth. When we have a behavior problem, an attitude problem, a spiritual problem, performance problem, you're really afraid to tell us the truth because you're always the nice guy. So we find out reality from other people. And we need your correction and you shooting us straight in love and grace. And that's why we don't trust you. And he came back and his whole world went upside down. He said, I got some work to do. And we began working on a man who came from a family where he would learned to be the nice guy but never be honest and never shoot straight and never confront because he was afraid if he confronted people that they'd be upset with him, he'd hurt their feelings. So we learned to have a lot of grace, and tru- but not a lot of truth. And we look in Ephesians, it says, speak the truth in love. He was more of the love in than the truth in, and it was hurting his ministry. But he's a good man. And he went to work, and he dealt with his fears of telling the truth and confrontation, and his scores went back up. You see what I mean? It's the character that drives the competency. It's the character that brings the fruit, whatever your context is, whatever your leadership's going to be. Well, there are two sides to our character. Right now, you might be thinking, yeah, I know some characters in my life, but I'm kind of talking about the other part. There are two sides to this. One is I, I like to call the good to great. Now, there's a business leader named Jim Collins. He writes, and he's really done a lot of great work for helping organizations. And Good to Great talks about how people and organizations can make a a well-functioning organization better. A good church can be a great church. But this also applies to our character. There are aspects to you, inside you, that are doing okay. But you want to strengthen them. You want to be the best at them, not in any kind of prideful way, but in an excellence way. Ephesians 4 talks about this. Well, Paul says, until we all reach unity in the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the good to great. You may, for example, be a very warm and encouraging person. You're not broken there. You're doing well. But you want to read books on it and get mentoring on it and see what the Bible says about it and go to conferences on it because you want to go good to great. You may be a person who's very clear in your biblical teaching and you're able to to understand the Word of God and bring it to people in a way that they understand and they're challenged and and, and grow from it. And you want to make sure you're going good to great. Most people come to DTS because God called them because they're doing something good and they wanted to make it great. That's the first aspect of character. And pay attention to that because you were given a gift and there's a responsibility there. There's a second aspect of character. And that's what I call the broken to restored. And the broken to restored part of our character is when we have an issue, when we have a failing, when we have a weakness that we need to be working on so that we don't disqualify ourselves from ministry, so that we don't lose heart, so that we don't have a problem in relationships. The book of Hebrews talks about that in Hebrews 12, chapter 2, where the author says, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. I've got feeble arms and weak knees. I've got good to great, I hope. 
but I know I've got the feeble arms and weak knees. You have good to great. You've also got feeble arms and weak knees. For example, maybe you've got a chronic habit or a sin that won't go away. It just won't go away no matter how hard you try. Maybe you've got a fear of letting other people know you in a deep level. We call those trust issues. Maybe it's been hard to open up and be very, very vulnerable in relationships. That's a weak knee. Maybe it's hard for you to be honest because you don't want other people to react negatively. So like my friend, you end up being the good guy all the time to the detriment of the truth. That's a weak knee. I was teaching this to some people a few years ago, and a guy came up to me and said, I understand the good to great part, but I think I've kind of dealt with the weak knee part. I said, that's interesting. Tell me about that. And he said, well, I, and I think, you know, my faith is good, and I kind of have it together and not perfect or anything. I said, well, are you willing to do an experiment? I mean, to try out, to see if you do have some weak knees anywhere? He said, sure, sure, what do I do? I said, well, go to a couple of people in your life. He was married. I said, first go to your spouse and say, this crazy guy said something about issues and weak knees. And hypothetically, in an alternate universe, would I have any issues? <laughs> and see what your spouse and your best friend would say. And I said, now let me, let me kind of set this up. If you ask somebody, do I have weak knees and issues and brokenness, and they say to you, you, brokenness, you are the fourth member of the Trinity. <laughs> how, could, how could anybody ask that question? My eyes hurt from looking at you because the aura is so bright. And I said, if your friend says that to you, thank them very much, get in your car, and you put that thing in reverse and get out of there. Because the Bible has a lot to say about the deception of flattery. Watch out for that. But suppose you ask that question to your spouse or your friend and say, you know, do I have any real issues? You know, I think I'm walking the walk and talking the talk. And if that friend or spouse says to you, you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> how, how much time do we have? Okay, pull up a chair. I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, let's start with the A's because <laughs> it'll be more organized. <laughs> You've got a friend, the faithful of the wounds of a friend, and you'll find out the wake of your life and the fruit of your life by the people who know you the best. I've had to do it, and I try to do it regularly, and sometimes the surgery isn't fun, but I have this deathly fear that I'll be disqualified because of some blind spot in my broken to restored, and I want to make sure it's all cleaned out so that I can continue the ministry. So we've all got those two parts. Think for a second about what God called you to. He gave you a passion for somebody in some way, teaching, preaching, ministering, counseling, care, leadership, but you've also got some feeble arms and weak knees. In the next few days, we're going to be unpacking three essential aspects of the character of the leader because this is sort of a training to help you to get ready for what's out there. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about character and handling your relationships, relationship with God, relationship with other people. And I've, I've got a Prof. Hendricks story I'm going to tell where he changed the direction of my life with something he said. Thursday, we're going to talk about your relationship with the truth and handling truth and what that has to do with character. Friday, we're going to talk about handling reality because in the ministry, whatever you're doing, you're going to be dealing with reality, the way life really is in the My Cindy story and what character has to do with that. I'll give you an example of how this works the right way. A friend of mine, and I can say his name because I've written about him and he gave me permission. Um, his name is Eric Hurd, and he's a pastor on the West Coast. And <clears throat> he was in Dr. Swindoll's church in Fullerton, California, before Dr. Swindoll came here. 
And you know, Dr. Swindoll has these cruises where he speaks and preaches and people get in the boat and have a good time. And so, <laughs> real good time. And, and, and so, uh, Eric was one of the, the key pastors to go there and to help the experience. He was a young pastor at the time. And they got on the, on the, the, the cruise and Dr. Swindoll's preaching. Well, Eric got a telegram. He was in his late 20s. He got a telegram on this cruise. His father had died unexpectedly out of the blue. Now, let me give you some history. Eric had a very bad relationship with his father. I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but his father wasn't a good man. There wasn't a lot of connection there. There wasn't a lot of fathering. There wasn't a lot of parenting. It was a very, very strained and difficult relationship. Put yourself in Eric's shoes for a second. You're thousands of miles from home. And the one man that you would like to reconcile with, say, I forgive you. Say, will you forgive me? Say, I love you. I'm going to miss you. Sorry. Say, I had some dreams for a dad and they never happened. And to say, I've got regrets and I don't know what to do with them. That will never happen now. Eric's 28 and it'll never happen. The redemptive conversation that we all want to have with people we love. It's gone forever. The window's closed. He's sitting there on the shuffleboard deck in a deck chair looking out of the ocean and he's, he has no idea what to say what to do. He's in shock. He hears a noise. Chuck Swindoll walks up to him and says, can I sit down? Yeah. He says, take all the time you need. I've cleared my schedule. He had speaking appointments. People had paid to be on the cruise. Clear the deck. Take all the time you need. I've cleared the schedule. And Eric slowly began to open up about all those dreams and all those longings and all those thoughts and all the conversations that never would be, and he poured his heart out. In fact, I think it was a couple of hours. Just everything came out. Chuck's window just sat there. Said a few things. It was mainly more the presence than the words, you know. Eric kind of got put back together and went back to work. Chuck went back to work. And I asked Eric, what impact did that have on you as a leader? Because he's a good leader. He said, if Chuck Swindoll called me today from across the world and said, I need you, he said, I'd be on the next plane. Imagine that kind of loyalty. Well, it was really no mystery, right? Because Dr. Swindoll had the character to reach out and get out of his comfort zone and get out of a schedule. And I'm sure he had lots of people yelling and screaming and mad at him to do what was the right thing for somebody who was so broken. That's character. You've got gifts, you've got abilities, but he was a model for Eric on what that means. And forever, Eric's life and ministry and all the generations after him have been transformed by that experience on that shuffleboard deck. Well, I have lots of thoughts about Cindy to return to her. You know, I wish I had a time machine and I wish I could go back and, and say things to her and I, I don't have that. That window's closed. That opportunity is closed. And I've looked for her, actually. I've, I've done my Google searches, and I can't find her. But I know one thing. I know what I would say because I've talked to hundreds of Cindy's since then. And if I had that opportunity, I would tell her what I told those other hundreds of people. And it would be something like this. I'm really sorry. And there probably aren't words for what you're going through. But tomorrow morning, I'm going to pick you up and take you to a really good church. 
And there's some women there that will love you. And they're going to get you in a, a domestic violence shelter, and they're going to teach you some things about God and about protecting yourself and about trust. And there's a board of elders there who are really strong, and they may have to do some kind of measures for this, but they're going to protect you, and they're going to strengthen you. And I'll give her a Bible. And I'd say, look, here's what the Bible says in Hebrews 12 too. It says that we're supposed to strengthen the knees that are feeble and the arms that are weak. You're in that place right now. We're going to help you. Here's the Bible. I can't do that. But that's what happens. Because when we get to know our anthropology as well as our bibliology and our Christology and our theology proper, then we've got the whole Megillah then everything comes into to place because we understand character. So I'm kind of a homework guy. I believe, I believe in homework assignment. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. It's not a big deal, but it'll get you some gravity. This week, go to two people. Remember my story earlier? Go to two, two people. Don't just go to your spouse because, you know, they're a biased sample. Go to your spouse plus one other person, somebody you trust and say, where am I good and I need to grow and get great? You know, maybe you need more training in some area or you need to be the best in class at something, not in the competitive level, just because you want to be living your mission. And then also say, where am I broken? Where do I need to be restored? And if you've got good people around you, they will be the hands and eyes and feet of Jesus and will speak the truth to you in a loving and direct way and can really give you hope that whatever's going on inside you that's going on inside all of us will not disqualify you. I'm going to talk about disqualification a little bit tomorrow, but you don't want that to happen. So protect yourself now. Go to God's resources. Do the homework assignment, and hopefully it'll be really, really a good endeavor that will bring you the right fruit you need. So, we'll be going over that tomorrow. Why don't we pray? Father, thank you for leaders. Thank you for the calling. Thank you for the fact that it has a cost that is unusual and it has a benefit that's unusual. But God, I pray for every person here that you will send your Word and your Holy Spirit and the body of Christ to every person to help them to break the strongholds, go good to great, and restore the brokenness. In Jesus' name, amen. See you tomorrow.